according to this, we should be streaming. Let me know if anybody can confirm. I see a live stream on YouTube. Hmm, not Facebook though? You, you see it on Facebook? Oh, I, I see it on Facebook now as well, yes. Live on Facebook and YouTube. Great, and so we also should be on Twitter through Periscope, but that's the least of my concerns. Okay, and I'm gonna put up the splash page and I'm gonna start admitting folks in unless, um, here, I'm gonna make you, oh, you already are a co-host. So I'm just gonna go dark until we get started with this. Perfect amount of time to watch it probably twice. You can admit people in. For some reason my computer is having a hard time playing this video. I might just switch to a still. Sorry, folks, the, it's like I'm, I'm maxed out my computer's GPU. We are live on Twitter, in case you're wondering. Um, Bobby, is there YouTube chat? Like, is that somewhere that we're going to be taking questions through? Um, if you want to try to monitor that, uh, we have Allison and Karina trying to monitor those channels. So I think they're they're going to tell us if uh, you know. I just see I just see it says chat is disabled on the live stream on YouTube. That might be best because YouTube is the wild west, as you know. <laughs> I I know I know I was just checking. We'll get all kinds of nutties, uh, probably. Hold on. So it's going to be mainly just uh, Zoom that we take questions through? Yeah, the, it, that's kind of because it's limited to 100. Yep, yep. Sounds good. Yeah, Christian, um, I believe Allison and Anna are going to be adding the questions to a Google Doc that I can share with you, and I'm going to be asking the questions live to Bobby. Okay, cool. Yeah, you can share that doc with me. All right, folks, we will get started right away. Those of you, or have you let anybody in yet, Karina? Or am I talking to just us? It's on live stream. So if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or on Periscope with Twitter, please know we will begin our broadcast at 3 o'clock. So please stay tuned. We're about to begin. All right, here's my hastily arranged splash page. I tried to do something cooler, but the video wasn't working out. It was getting choppy, like the frames. And NASA's live stream's already going on. I'm just confirming you folks can all see this picture, right? Of uh, the map of the landing site. Okay. 
Yeah, I see it. Bobby, do you have NASA eyes by chance? Able to pulled up. I have. I think I've installed it, but I haven't used it in a while. Is that the one that tells you all the the locations of all the? Yeah, yeah. I was seeing um, on another live stream they had it with like live telemetry, or it was live as we're receiving the telemetry, and it shows the the capsule coming in towards Mars. That'd be a good like visual. Oh yeah, I also have this cool picture of the traffic jam around Mars. It talks about all of the different missions uh, that are currently there. Yeah, three of them arriving all within a week. Well, I found roughly the area where it's landing on Mars. The Jezero crater is in the Isidis Planitia. Take a showtime, Karina. All right, everyone. Can you all hear me? I yes. think we're good. All right. My name is Karina Weiss, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. I'd like to welcome you all to our Mars rover landing watch party. A big thank you to those of you who have sent in some amazing questions, which we will do our best to answer during this broadcast. If you don't have time or you didn't have time to send in yours, or if you have any questions during our live stream, please send them our way by putting them in the Zoom chat or in the comments section on our Facebook live feed. And now I'll turn it over to our science educator, Bobby Farley's Rubio, who will do his best to explain all of the details of the mission, the history of Mars exploration, and most importantly, to answer your questions. Oh, thank you, Karina, and welcome everyone to our first ever attempt to narrate a, a live landing of a robot on another planet. This is a new thing for the Fairbanks Museum, but this is an exciting time. Maybe some of you remember back in 2012 when Curiosity, the Mars Science Laboratory, landed. This is a similar type of robot, but with a very different objective. And the Perseverance rover I could say that the most exciting objective that it has to study on Mars is the possibility of finding life. One of the instruments called Pixel is a probe that is designed to look for biosignatures. So if you're wondering what's the big deal about this robot that we're landing on Mars today, how many times have we done this before? We can answer those questions, but this one will be the first time that we specifically look to see if there are signs of biological life on Mars since the first time we landed on Mars with the Viking landers. Now, if you, I was not alive then, but if you were alive in the 1970s, you may have heard of the first time that NASA landed robots on Mars. The Viking missions had on board a test to test for life, but scientists were sadly found the results were inconclusive. But if you've been following Mars over the last few years, you probably know that since the Viking landers, we've sent other robots to Mars, including the Mars Phoenix, 
that proved that water still is on Mars in the frozen form, in ice. And then we've had other rovers like Spirit and Opportunity, the famous Pathfinder mission with Sojourner that was featured in that movie with Matt Damon, The Martian. We've also had Mars Insight, the geologist that was listening for Mars quakes. And we've had a lot of success with robots. If this one lands, I think it'll be the seventh in a row. But still, 40% of missions to Mars succeed. 60% have failed. So our country makes it look easy. NASA has made it look like this is routine, but this is not. And I want to prepare the audience for the unlikely but possible event that Perseverance may not make it to its landing site. That is another possibility we should be really ready for, but I don't think it's gonna happen. I'm confident this robot's gonna make it just fine. And I have, if you're wondering what this big red thing in my hand is, this is Mars, a globe of Mars. And I actually have the area called the Isidus Planitia. I know you probably haven't memorized your Mars maps yet, but that's gonna be coming soon to a social studies test near you kids. That's gonna become our geography one day when humans live on this planet and Earth. You're gonna to have to learn a lot more place names, but the Isidus Planitia is a relatively flat, sandy plain that you see here. That area that I'm circling is generally where the robot is going. But if I jump onto NASA's webpage real quick, I can show you the actual landing site, the Jezero crater. I don't have detail like that on this, but let me jump to NASA's webpage so you can see an image of where we're trying to land. That circle that you see is the target zone. So it could land somewhere, anywhere within that circle, but it's a very narrow area. And let me see if I can zoom out a little bit. Oh, and you can see some of the surrounding part of Mars. Well, already in this picture, you might have noticed besides the craters, there's something funny going on here. They've got it labeled at Zneretva Valles. That's the valley of Neretva, but look carefully. I don't think you need to be a planetary scientist to realize what this is. This. A river. Yeah, an ancient river. And right here is the delta where that river spilled its sediment out into the place that we call a crater but just like we discovered with the Gale Crater where the Curiosity rover landed, this crater was a lake. And it makes sense uh, if you think about it, but of course, all that sediment being carried by water into a lake that very likely was filled with fresh water based on what we've learned from the Curiosity rover, you have to wonder when this was flowing, could there have been life there? And actually, earlier today, uh, NASA posted a really cool picture on Twitter. So let's see if I could find this. But they had a picture of a lake in Turkey that is actually roughly the same size and shape and uh, composition uh, as far as where the river is to the one on Mars. And oh, I think I found the picture that NASA posted this morning. I'm going to show it to you. This is on a website, an engineering website, but there's a lake called Lake Salda. I've never been. I'd love to visit Turkey sometime, but it turns out that this earthly lake in the country of Turkey is roughly the same size as the Jezero crater. And can you see at the top left or the northwest part of the lake, it says alluvial fan delta? Well, that's the place where the water spills into the lake. And you can actually see sediment at the edges of the lake and sand. And you can imagine, well, they weren't having Turkish delights necessarily on the shores of this lake on Mars. But perhaps once upon a time, it looked a lot like this place in Turkey. Oh, sorry, stay on top of the latest engineering news. Sorry about that. So that was just a random picture that NASA posted this morning. And I thought that is the best way to get you to understand what we think Mars used to look like. We know it was a watery place. And it was that way for a long time. And while we're waiting for the new robot, let me maybe show you just some of the coolest findings of our previous mission to Mars that is still active, Curiosity. So I want to repeat, this picture I'm going to show you is not the new robot, Perseverance. It hasn't landed yet. And that's what we're hoping to see. But I'm actually going to ask, uh, I, have, I have to keep two eyes on things because I got the live stream from Mars going too. And I want to make sure we don't miss anything when it starts getting exciting in mission control. That's the moment where I'm going to stop talking 
and we're going to let the NASA folks take over because that's when they're going to hear the telemetry and the signals from the robot telling them whether or not they've succeeded. And that's the part I don't want to interfere with. So here is the last time we did this. This is Curiosity. And Curiosity, the Mars Science Laboratory, looks a lot like Perseverance. They have different instruments and slightly different builds, but I wouldn't blame you for thinking that they're like twins. And if you look at this picture, you can see that Curiosity is sitting right on top of some very flat cracked rocks that are very much like the shale sediment that you find here on Earth. In fact, this stuff is made out of clays just like you would squish between your toes if you go into a lake like Willoughby or Harvey's Lake. So this used to be a lake too. And one of the biggest discoveries that Curiosity made uh, uh, while it was tooling around at the basin of this lake was all these sedimentary rocks. So I know adults have probably heard of sediment and sedimentary rocks, but for the kids who may not know what this is, these are layers of mud that built up over time as every spring the snows on the Martian mountains and the rains on the Martian plains would sweep sediment like clay and dust into that lake and it would fill up the bottom and make layers every year kind of exactly like what happens in our lakes here in Vermont every spring. Think of mud season. Think of how much stuff you see flowing down the driveway and then it ends up in the pond or lake and it builds up and it makes another layer. So sedimentary rocks like this tell us not only was there water on Mars, but it was there for a long time, a long enough time to build up all of this sediment. And that's very exciting because it tells us that if life could have existed on Mars, it might have had a good amount of time to live and evolve before the planet became, as we could say, too cold for Goldilocks. So Mars typically goes to about 100 below zero or colder at night. So as you can imagine, whatever water would have been on Mars is now frozen. And here's just another picture of a similar uh, formation of sedimentary rock. So you can see that it wasn't just for a few years or a few decades, but millennia of rain and snow and water running downhill that caused this. So that was Curiosity's mission, was to discover if the conditions for life were possible on Mars for a significant amount of time. And you could say that it accomplished that mission. It determined that there definitely was uh, water for a long period of time. And I'm gonna take, let's start taking questions in a moment, but I'm gonna ask Christian, if you can be my spare set of eyes. Have you found, uh, do you know, have you found the live stream from NASA? Yeah, yeah, I have uh, the live stream with the uh, telemetry up, um, the oh, NASA yeah. eyes. I'm talking about the one with the uh, the folks that are the comment. Oh, the JPL stream. Yeah, I can pull that up as well, real quick. If you could do me the favor, I I don't want to miss any of the exciting moments. So if you can keep your eyes on that and give me a heads up when they switch from uh, talking heads to mission control camera, and I, I think that's when we'll uh, switch over. It's going to be in the next 15 to 20 minutes, so I don't want to miss it. And yep. so, all right. Well, now. Where, where, where was I? Well, let me just show you the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about, which is a mission that definitely did not get as much attention as the Curiosity rover. It was a mission that was built at the University of Arizona, so it shouldn't surprise you, given their location, that it was called the Mars Phoenix. And the Mars Phoenix was not a rover. It was simply a lander, but it landed in a place on Mars that we haven't landed before or since, near the North Pole. Now, let me just show you a little bit of Mars here. Though I, I don't want to assume that everybody watching knows everything about Mars already. So maybe I should start just with some basics. Here is Mars, the red planet. Why is it red? Because it's covered in iron rich, rusty dust. Yes, kids, the same reason why your blood turns red because it has iron and oxygen plus iron makes a rust that has, uh, helps your cells carry that oxygen through your body. Well, if you ever cut your tongue or lose a tooth and taste your own blood, I hope none of you are vampires. I hope you're not tasting other people's blood. But when you taste your own blood, you probably notice it tastes metallic because it's high in iron from the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. Well, strangely enough, 
Mars is known as the red planet and it was named for the Roman god of war, probably because it looked like the color of blood. But no, Mars is not a bloody place. But the thing that makes it red is the same thing that makes your blood red, iron. That's an interesting fact. But if you look at this picture, you also see clouds, thin, wispy clouds. Mars has an atmosphere, but it is 1% as thick as ours. So it's like a thin veil of an atmosphere compared to our robust, thick atmosphere that we have here on Earth. And that air is mostly carbon dioxide. So if you know carbon dioxide, what we also call dry ice, it can freeze and turns into a solid white ice similar to frozen water. So the white stuff you see in the top of that picture is actually dry ice, CO2. And in order to get CO2 to freeze, it has to be at least 110 below zero. That tells you how cold Mars is, that even in the sunshine, dry ice can stay frozen. And those wispy clouds you see in this uh, image, those are also uh, like puffs of dry ice floating in the atmosphere. But sometimes it can be cloudy a little bit on Mars, but it's never very cloudy. In fact, if you were worried about the weather on Mars, dust storms would be your biggest concern. So where's the water? It's all CO2. There's no water visible in this picture. But if you look down, can you folks see that giant scratch running east to west about three quarters of the way down in the southern hemisphere? That is a canyon called the Mariner's Valley. That canyon is about as wide as the United States and almost deep enough to fit Mount Everest inside without poking out. So a water carved canyon on Mars that's actually something that was discovered in the 1880s. And that's what started humans fascination with the idea that there might be Martians. I could talk more about that history, but let's talk about the actual robot that proved that water, not frozen ice, carbon dioxide, but actual water is on Mars. This is the Mars Phoenix. That's a mock-up of what it looked like. This is what its engineering double in Arizona looks like. It's not a very big robot and it had no wheels, but it had one job to land and dig. And here's a picture of it landing. So we're gonna, well, I don't think we'll be lucky enough to get this kind of an image, but this is actually what robots landing on Mars look like from space. This was taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which happened to be flying overhead when Phoenix was coming down. And this is the area near where Phoenix landed. This is a picture that it took. And here is its own shadow. So you can see what the ground looks like up close. And yes, it has solar panels. They timed it so that it was during the Martian summer in the North so that they had sun pretty much all day long on those panels. But this is a cool thing that they found. That's water, folks. Is it Martian summer right now? Uh, I, I, I should know this, but I gotta. I have to look that up. I have to check. Maybe Christian, if you could do me a favor and check the timing. The season of Mars. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second because Mars's years are twice as long as ours. So all of their seasons are twice as long. And the most confounding thing for the scientists that we're going to see at JPL working on these Mars missions is that they have to synchronize with Martian time, which is 24 hours and 40 minutes per day, which doesn't sound like that different. Oh, it's only extra 40 minutes. But that means that if you wake up at six in the morning today to be ready for your job, tomorrow you wake up at 640. The next day you wake up at 720. The next day you wake up at eight o'clock. So it's almost like the jet lag of going from one time zone to another every day. You imagine those people get cranky. It's hard to talk to them. There was actually Mars uh, scientists from JPL on the Curiosity mission that let their kids synchronize with the parents' light work schedules. So the kids were out there riding their bikes in the middle of the street at two in the morning, three in the morning, because that was around the time when their parents woke up for morning on Mars. So just imagine that, folks. If we have people on Mars and people on Earth, think of how different it's going to be with time zones and, oh, is this a good time to send an email to my friend on Mars? Oh, no, they're, they're still in bed. So anyway, back to the picture. This is a boulder of water. It's frozen water. And it doesn't look like water. It looks like a rock. But if you notice, it's got cracks in it and those funny pits in it. This is what Mars Phoenix found when it was digging. And then it actually scooped up some of the soil, as you can see in this picture. And after it scooped the soil, you could see that parts of the soil darkened when exposed to the sunlight. Could that be melting, perhaps? And then when they looked at what was in the scoop, they saw definitive proof that there is water mixed in with the soil on Mars. So if you've heard this in the news, this is part of the data set. This is one of the pictures that proved it. 
plus the chemical analysis that they did. Of course, they don't just look at it pictures, but they drop these samples into a little bins. And this is actually similar to what we're gonna be doing with the, the new Mars robot. These little bins that you see that look like upside down uh, scoops, they catch the dirt from the bigger scoop and then it can be introduced into a little chemical analyzing chamber where they can find out exactly what's in the soil, vaporize it, use a laser to make a spectral uh, analysis. And I know some of this is terminology many folks may not have heard, but if you learn all the way that these robots work, you'll understand that they're basically like CSI laboratories in space. So that's Mars Phoenix. That was historic. But now that though that's back in the past, we now know, thanks to that robot, Mars has water. We know thanks to Curiosity that the conditions where water existed on the surface in lakes was not a short fleeting moment in time, but a long period of time. And so now Perseverance has a new job. Its job is to find out if that watery time, that environment where it was warm and wet on Mars was conducive to life to the point where we actually can find biosignatures. So the instrument called Pixel is the one that we're gonna be using to make that determination. So let me see, we, uh, Christian, I don't know what it looks like at JPL right now, but let me know um, if we have any questions, Karina, coming in from the folks that are tuned in now. Um, I have something about the seasons you're asking about. Yeah. Um, I posted the link in the Zoom chat, but it would appear that uh, for the northern hemisphere of Mars, they just entered um, spring. Uh, the spring equinox was on February 7th. So it's spring, and then it'll be going into summer for Perseverance. But that means six months of spring, not three like we have here on Earth. <laughs> yeah. So they have a long spring to go. But also one thing to know is that where the Perseverance is landing is very close to the equator. So just like here on Earth, the seasonal changes are less dramatic near the equator where the sunlight is more constant, similar to like if you live in the tropics of the Earth, you're not going to think about winter coming like they do, you know, up in the north near the wall winter is coming so anyway see who got that reference but anyway that's all so old now um so any other questions coming in from folks yes. I'm glad have that question and thanks for posting the yesidis planitia wikipedia page too i think that'll be interesting if you are a big nerd like me you might know that the starship enterprise that captain picard was the captain of was built on mars in the star trek world and they built it at a place called utopia planitia which is a different plane on Mars. So that's actually when I began learning about Mars geography, believe it or not, was thanks to Star Trek, like so many folks. That show directed me into the job I do now. So the I have a question here I see on the chat. How many millions of years ago was it still water? Well, that's the thing. It's thought to have been maybe billions of years ago. So we, you can imagine that there might have been a time when if you had a spaceship and you flew into the solar system, there would have been two blue planets. One of them was ours, Earth, and the other one was half-sized, Mars. And over time, one of the blue planets dried up and got frozen, and the other blue planet stayed very comfortable for life, as we would like to think. So this is the question. How do we know that life uh, started on Earth. What if life started on Mars and hitched a ride on a meteor to Earth and we are the Martians we've been looking for? I know it sounds silly, but this is something I think about all the time. And this Mars mission might turn that speculation into some real data. We might actually be able to see if life existed on Mars and maybe with future missions, we'll be able to find exactly when that life lived and one other thing about this robot is that it's gonna take two more missions to make it real, but Perseverance has a canister where it's going to package up some of the Martian materials that it studies, put them into a canister, and a future Mars mission is gonna come, pick that up and launch it into space. And then a second, another Mars mission is gonna or, uh, you know, rendezvous with the orbiting canister and we'll get it back here on Earth this might not be for a few years, but this mission will be the first effort that we make 
to get a piece of Mars back to the Earth. So as sophisticated as our laboratories on Earth are, I mean, on Mars are in these robots, the stuff we have on Earth is way better. And we would definitely would like to see it ourselves. So this is not going to be the end of the story with Mars. As a matter of fact, it's just the beginning because another instrument on the rover that you should know about is called MOXIE. And MOXIE's job is to turn carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into oxygen that we can breathe. Now, obviously the robot doesn't need oxygen. It uh, doesn't breathe. But MOXIE is an experiment that is going to help human missions to Mars. MOXIE might be the prototype of the oxygen generator that will be attached to the human habitat that maybe one of the kids that's listening on, in on this conversation will be a part of. Who knows? One of the kids watching now might be one of the first people to walk on Mars. It's actually that close to happening. Maybe 10 to 15 years from now, we'll see humans walking on this red planet. And what we learn starting today with Perseverance is gonna guide how we get them there. So. Let me see if we have any questions coming up. Yes, Bobby, we have a, a list of questions that people sent in. So I can start with those. Um, Yanni, age seven, and Re, age nine, from Montgomery, Vermont, to ask, will you show us the rover moving around the planet? Okay. I can't do that only because the pictures that the rover is going to take come from itself, and that's going to take day hours or days i mean actually they'll probably send us a couple pictures today that we can confirm the landing but the good detailed images that can get turned into videos those will take months to produce because the well we have internet with mars and some of us here in vermont will be frustrated to find out that there's actually global wi-fi on mars thanks to all the things we have orbiting so actually there's places on mars that have better internet than places in vermont but not to complain however it's still very slow download and upload speeds. So if you can imagine those of you old enough to remember dial up internet, it's at that level of slow. The picture comes in one line at a time. You have to be patient. So it's not gonna be the kind of thing where we see a video live, like if we put a GoPro on the top of this robot's head. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. So you should expect to see those awesome videos later, like that selfie that I showed you that curiosity took of itself. That's something that they piece together is actually a composite image. So even this picture that I'm going to show you again, that looks like one picture is actually more than, I think, 17 pictures stitched together. The robot's arm had the camera, so they moved the camera to different places, and then they made a mosaic of it. And that's how you get these wonderful images. But let me show you where you can go to satisfy your curiosity, oh, no pun intended, about what this thing will look like on the surface because JPL has on their page a whole entire uh, archive of videos. So I'm gonna take you to the, I'm gonna just get the link for the video section. And I you know, hope that you will wait till after our broadcast to watch these, but um, this will get you what you want to see. This is where you'll see the animations made by folks with CGI. Hold on a second, I'm gonna just put it in the chat. So everyone who is curious, look at your chat window and hit that link and you will be able to see all of the cool CGI videos that NASA has made to demonstrate how the robot's gonna land and how it's gonna operate. But remember that these are all animated on earth because we haven't seen this happen yet and let's hope it all works. So. Any more questions? Because I, gosh, I want to make sure we get through some of them before I turn it over to NASA's live stream. Yes. Um, Elizabeth, age eight, Oliver, age six, and Isaiah, age four, from Lindenville, Vermont, want to know how big is Mars and how does the rover land there? Okay. Well, I can't wait to explain this. This is actually one of the most fun things to answer. First, the, ro the planet Mars is about roughly half the size of the Earth. But um, if you want another way to think about it, think about how the Earth is mostly water and only about a quarter land. And all the land on Earth is equal to the surface of Mars. So even though Mars is a smaller planet, because there's no ocean, 
it has the same amount of land surface as our planet. Weird, right? But that's because most of our planet is covered in water. So Mars is half the size of the Earth, but about the same amount of land as the Earth, if you can wrap your head around that. And then that also means that because Mars is a smaller planet, it has less gravity, three eighths the gravity. So do the math, you'll weigh less than half of what you do here on Earth. So, you know, just to make it easy, if you weigh 180 pounds here on this planet, let's, wait, let's see, 160 pounds on this planet, then I'm just making it easy for myself, then you'd only weigh 60 pounds on Mars. So think of how awesome all of you will be at basketball if we play on Mars. All of you will be able to slam dunk. Maybe you never could before, but now on Mars, you probably could slam dunk on a regulation NBA rim. So now, what, what was the next question on that? I think I answered part of their question, but make sure I got all yes. of it. Yes, uh, they wanted to know how does the rover land on Mars? Ah, this, I actually see that they're switching to mission control, so we might actually get a, a, an animated view, but basically, uh, it, they call it the seven minutes of terror. It comes screaming in like a meteor through the atmosphere, slowing down by the friction of the air, just like the hot rocks that we see. Oh, a shooting star. It'll look like that. It'll be over a thousand degrees on the outside. And then as it slows down, it drops the heat shield and it opens a parachute. The parachute is the biggest, strongest parachute humans have ever made. It would be like a tote bag that weighs 100 pounds, but could carry 15 elephants. So imagine how strong this parachute is. And that parachute has to slow it down from thousands of miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. Then, but still going too fast. So as it plummets like a rock, the robot will fire rockets that will make it slow down, retro rockets. And those retro rockets will slow it down to almost zero miles per hour as it hovers above the ground about 20 meters up about you know 70 feet up it starts to drop the robot on a cable like a crane they call it the sky crane and they have really good videos that explain it way more dramatically than i am but the sky crane which was a new maneuver in 2012 with curiosity we had never tried it before so this is literally the second time we do this the sky crane dropped the robot down gently it cut the cords and the jet pack that dropped it flies off to the distance safely crashes and becomes a monument to human ingenuity for the future or junk, depending on your opinion. But the robot hopefully makes it safely onto the ground. And that's about to happen now. So um, Christian, you gotta get, tell me, I saw the camera switch to mission control. They're still patiently waiting. And I have to explain one more yep. strange feature about Mars. Folks, those of you who are not familiar with uh, space missions should know that Mars is pretty far away from us, million, hundreds of millions of miles away. And it means that radio signals take several minutes to get here from there. Actually something close to like 14 minutes. So the robot has a landing maneuver that takes seven minutes to be accomplished, but it takes 14 minutes for us to find out what the robot is doing. So if anything goes wrong during those seven minutes of terror, by the time we find out, it's already over and it's too late for us to fix anything. So the robot has to be smart enough. And I mean, it's programming gives it a little bit of, I wouldn't say it's artificially intelligent, but it has a little bit of decision-making freedom as it's coming down. If it uses radar, it looks at the landing site. And if it sees a big boulder sitting in the middle of its landing site, the robot has the ability to steer itself away from the obstacle to look for the flattest landing spot. So it has a little bit of a, self-drive mode because it has to if we had to tell it what to do we would be telling it after it was over it would be too late and it takes 14 minutes for our signals to get to the robot but only seven minutes to land so anything we tell it arrives way too late so this means that everything we hear coming from mission control actually happened about 14 minutes before the humans on earth found out about it so that's a little bit of a frustrating thing. That might mean the robot's already landing right now, but we don't know because the signals haven't reached us yet. And this is all based on the speed of light, folks. The speed of light is the fastest thing in the universe. 186,000 miles per second, 300,000 kilometers per second, 671 million miles an hour. However, it still takes minutes for light to reach Earth from Mars. So those of you kids who are planning on uh, having FaceTime with your friends while you're on Mars or doing TikTok videos that they can watch live. No, it's not gonna work. 
because if you make a phone call from Mars, even with the best radio antenna, it'll take 14 minutes for the signal to get to Earth. And you'll be like, hey, is everybody listening? 14 minutes later, all your friends on Earth will be like, what did you say? We weren't paying attention. And then another 14 minutes pass and you realize you wasted 28 minutes because your friends weren't listening at the right time. So let me say that phone calls are going to be banned on Mars because it's just going to be too frustrating and everything's going to have to be a live, uh, I mean, not live, but like a text or a video message that you send your friends. So let's look at it this way. Whatever we hear today from the rover, it happened 14 minutes before we heard it. And that is a weird thing to think about. It sounds almost like time travel, but that is what we have to get used to as humans become a space-faring civilization. We're going to have to get used to talking to people who are hundreds of millions of miles away, perhaps, instead of just thousands of miles away here on Big Mother Earth. So it's getting close to the time when they said it would land. But when I look yeah, at- Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have an update here from the, from the JPL stream, uh, if you'd like. So. Apparently, um, we're a few minutes away from the, in real time, the rover beginning to enter the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, but it's still about 20 minutes away from when we will get the signal back. And it's about 4,600 kilometers from the landing site. So it's still, um, from the telemetry we're getting, it's still not uh, quite at Mars yet. But it's going to be coming in uh, about 20 minutes from now. Oh, well, that's later than expected. But that's why we gave ourselves a nice window for this live stream so that we could accommodate for that. All that means to me is that we got more time to answer folks' questions. So thank you, Christian, for that update. And I would love to know if there's anybody. Oh, it looks like Christian gave you a good uh, picture from Wikipedia of the sky crane and the parachute. Yes, the seven minutes of terror video. I would, I would play it for you folks, except I don't want to take away from the chance to answer your questions. But those are videos that you can find on YouTube and on JPL's page, like the one I sent you. And you can see everything that this robot's going to do. And I still haven't mentioned another part of the mission, which is the helicopter. You folks know what I'm talking about. There's a little sidekick to person. It's called Ingenuity. And it is a helicopter drone that only weighs about a pound. I, well, I think I, I calculated it weighs about three quarters of a pound on Mars weighs four pounds on earth. Maybe I'm wrong with that map, I forget. But the point is it's super light and it has really long propellers because Mars has such thin air that you need huge rotors if you're gonna be able to fly a helicopter drone there compared to what we have on earth. So if you haven't seen it on the webpage for NASA for NASA's Perseverance uh, robot, you can see Ingenuity. Let me, let me get you a picture of that so you folks can see what is also like a separate mission kind of, but an amazing feat. It's not getting all the attention of course, but if we make this work, that means that we've also, for the first time in human history, made an aircraft fly in the atmosphere of another planet. So that by itself would be a big deal, but that just shows you what we've gotten used to doing with NASA. NASA has made it seem like this stuff is easy, but I hope you kids realize how amazing this stuff is. And that's ingenuity the Mars helicopter. Its job is mostly a demonstration, but if it works, it will have a camera on board and it will be able to fly much farther and faster around the area where Perseverance is and it will give reconnaissance. It'll tell it, you know, by the pictures that it takes, if there's anything interesting to look at. And this little guy might be the thing that discovers the big surprise of the mission as it can fly farther and faster around the area than the relatively slow rover. I know some of you may be thinking, can I do donuts with that thing on Mars? How fast is that robot? Well, it's not a go-kart. It's not a race car. It's not meant to go fast. In fact, you'd be incredibly frustrated if you were standing next to it because it would crawl at a snail's pace. They don't want to mess up and crash the thing, but the robot also has the ability to steer. So if the, ro if the folks at JPL tell the robot, go forward, the robot starts moving forward and it sees a rock that they didn't tell it was there. The robot doesn't wait for instructions. It can so-called think for itself enough to steer around and get away from the obstacle. So let's see who, who's got more questions. How big is the rover? Somebody asked, well, it's actually about the size of a Subaru. And I think that's a measurement that most Vermonters will understand. 
It is about the size of a Subaru station wagon. <laughs> uh, not, not quite as solid. It's got a lot, you know, it's kind of like spidery with long legs and small wheels, but it's not tiny either. And actually, how much would an anvil weigh in space? Okay, depending on which planet you're on. And if you're floating in space, it weighs nothing because there's no gravity to give it weight. It will still be just as massive, but I'm gonna move on. I just wanna make sure uh, I show you, um, uh, well, I have a comparison picture here. So for those of you curious about the rovers, here is a picture of three of the types of rovers that we've sent to Mars side by side. So you can see what they look like and you get an idea of their sizes. So the one on the front, that one landed in the 1990s, way back in ancient times, the 20th century. That was the Mars Pathfinder mission, Sojourner. So if you saw that movie with Matt Damon, The Martian, you saw that little thing tootling around inside of his habitat as he had rescued it from the sand. But the real Sojourner is probably buried under the sand of Mars by now. It hasn't worked for decades. But then Spirit and Opportunity, there were actually two of them and they're identical twins, but they were sent to opposite sides of Mars and they're solar powered like Sojourner. They were only meant to last for 30 days, but both of them lasted uh, for about a decade. Opportunity lasted way longer up until just a couple of years ago. It shut down and not because it broke, but because Mars is so dusty that Opportunity solar panels got completely covered by the sand and its ability to make electricity was shut down. So it died because of dust. However, Curiosity on the right is a lot bigger and you might notice that it does not have any solar panels at all. That's because Curiosity, like Perseverance that's landing today, is not powered by the sun, but powered by nuclear fission, plutonium. As a matter of fact, it's not so much fission like a nuclear reactor, but radioactive decay of plutonium. Now, this might sound alarming to some folks because you've heard of plutonium being used in atomic weapons or in Doc Brown's time machine. But in reality, plutonium is an artificial element that humans invented during the time of the Manhattan Project. But plutonium gives off heat. And if you capture the hot plutonium in an RTG, a radioisotope thermal generator, you can take the heat from the plutonium and use it to heat up your spacecraft, but also use it to generate electricity through a thermal couple. So those of you who have followed space missions may have heard of Voyager, the spaceship that has flown farthest from the earth in human history. Some of you may have heard of the Cassini mission that went around Saturn for a decade. And this, this robot, Curiosity and Perseverance, they're all powered by plutonium because that works no matter how dark and cold it gets. And this might be disturbing to folks because you might be thinking plutonium that's radioactive we we should be careful with that stuff and for sure the nasa scientists are very aware of its dangers but i don't know how many people know that people have carried plutonium battery packs in their chest you see plutonium rtgs were also the original power supply for pacemakers so there are thousands maybe millions of people on this earth who have had a plutonium RTG in their chest running a device that keeps their heart beating. And just imagine if you have a pacemaker, you don't wanna have a battery change every few weeks. You don't wanna have to get a surgery to put in another pair of Duracells on your pacemaker. And you don't wanna have to plug your heart into, I mean, imagine that, oh, where's my charging block? My heart pacemaker, I need to charge it. That would be a disaster. So instead, a long time ago, they figured out how to make plutonium batteries this big they could insert with the pacemaker and they would last for a decade or more. So you wouldn't have to have heart surgery every few weeks to change the batteries. And hold on, I can actually show you a picture of one of these. Now, I'll take the next question while I get this out, but I want you to know that plutonium, if you had a pacemaker installed, Back in the 1970s, this is the actual canister that had the plutonium inside, and this would have been buried inside of someone's chest. So I know plutonium sounds crazy, but all those folks with pacemakers never complained because they were happy that it was keeping them alive. So that's the same kind of power source we're using for this robot today, a plutonium-based power source. 
Now, solar would be awesome, but solar has limitations on Mars. When we have humans on Mars, I guarantee that our, our facilities will be running on solar panels, but that's because you could get one of the astronauts to go out there with a broom and sweep off the solar panels every few days. Unfortunately, we didn't design that into opportunity. So you can see what happened after it sat there for so many years on Mars, it got so much dust accumulated on its panels that they just basically stopped working. And it was never heard from again. Oh, I'm getting all kinds of extraneous pictures here. But so next question, and let me know if uh, what's going on at JPL there. Uh, yeah, Chris Bobby, I just had a had a, a quick update. Um, so the uh, the transfer stage, the interplanetary service module, I guess you could call it, uh, basically for people to know what that is, it's like the part with all the batteries and solar panels for what when the craft is going to Mars. That has separated, so now it's just the aero shell with the rover inside that's uh, descending down to Mars. And we're coming up on 11 minutes now for um, when we should be getting uh, the signal on whether the craft has landed or not. So right now, I believe the craft should have already entered the atmosphere, well, and it's, five minutes it's during that. So thank you, Christian, for that update. And actually, this is the time when I'm going to have to pause my talk because I want to switch over to JPL because, as Christian just told you, we're minutes away from landing, but the, the, the seven minutes of terror is about to begin. We're five minutes and 40 seconds or oh, five minutes, four minutes and 50 seconds away from atmospheric entry. So I'm going to switch to the JPL feed and I'll be here to answer questions, possibly through the chat and maybe in, in word if I can do it without interrupting their feed. But I definitely want to hear because this is the part where the drama comes, folks. This is the part where the excitement comes and I'll get out of the way. Let me show you in. Oh. There's the mission control right now. Karina, does everybody see that full screen? Can you see? Yes. It's very smart folks. And let me put the audio on so we can hear what they're talking about. Here, we're just like local one from entry interface. So if you look on the bottom right, you can see atmospheric entry, four minutes and counting. One to zero, as Swati said, uh, but to land safely, but we, we really need it for our own uh, health and well-being today to keep our nerves in control. But Around this time, a second spacecraft, MAVEN, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post-landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. Okay. Very soon we'll be getting ones and zeros, I hope, from our radio on the rover. All right, just a little translation for you folks. MAVEN is a spacecraft already there. It's gonna help relay the signals. It's an atmospheric orbiter. The entry interface is nothing more than just an arbitrary place in the sky that we've defined to be above the atmosphere. But, th but from that point on, uh, there's definitely uh, atmosphere. And above it, there isn't. We are two minutes from entry interface. Perseverance is to transmit heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. So heartbeat so the tones. tones can tell us whether something is bad or not is happening. So, so far the heartbeat is, is doing well. So the vehicle thinks it's happening. It's uh, in good shape to land, which is a great sign. Can you tell how nervous they are folks? So there will be a moment where they lose contact. Uh, Same thing when we lost contact with the Apollo astronauts during that burn where they're making plasma around the capsule, the radio signals won't get out. So there is We're this moment of two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. Okay. This is when they find out if all that work is going to come to fruition or not. EDL stands for entry, descent, and landing, folks. So that's what that's, you see everywhere. This is the most terrifying moment of any space mission. The entry, which is happening in a minute. The descent, 
which is the parachute and rockets, and then, of course, landing. One minute on entry interface. So in one minute, this rover that's been frozen cold in space at least 200 below zero is going to start rubbing the atmosphere so hard that it's going to get hot like a meteor, and it'll actually be over 1,000 degrees on the outside in a matter of seconds from very cold. We have confirmation that the reconnaissance orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. All right, those are, data flow. if there's any superstitious people out there, this is the time to start doing those superstitious things. You know, cross your fingers, spin around, say your name backwards, whatever. Entry interface. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. There's the target and it's beginning. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The ship is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars slow down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Okay. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing a little plasma blackout at this point. Did you hear the plasma blackout they just mentioned? That's when, if you watched Apollo 13 or any other movie about astronauts returning to the Earth, you've probably seen that the before. It's doing its turns right now. Hammer has lost luck. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. Camaro has lock again. 10 Gs of force as it slowed down. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Now, Karina, I just want to confirm, everybody's still seeing the full screen of mission control, right? Okay. I don't want them to be looking at my face. This is not a reaction video. I want you to see them. Perseverance is going about one kilometers per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. So, so she's referring to the adjustments. This uh, In this form, it has little thrusters that it can fire to steer itself to make sure that it's heading the right way. And that means it's completed that phase and it's heading right towards its target. This is not a live image. There's no camera crew floating over Mars, kids. This is just a simulation with animated, it's like a software. Our current program. velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. Now, what I wouldn't give to be standing on Mars and watching this thing from the other side. 
we are starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. So this means the, the heat shift. The has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 480 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. So if you hadn't heard it, that means the parachute is open and that means that it made it through the most dangerous part of the atmosphere. And that's a really good sign. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. All right, if you haven't seen the videos, the heat shield protects it, but it's also like a lens cap. So when it pops off, the camera and the radar can see, as she just said. So now the robot is actually picking its landing spot. And the sky crane maneuver will be soon. Yes, yes, yes. Current now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 kilometers of the surface. So everything is going perfectly well so far. Continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. I don't know if you folks saw the list of events on the side of the screen. But we have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Yeah, so what they're talking about there is the radar actually, it uses the radar to use AI to find the best landing position within a radius of where the lander's coming down. And so that just confirmed that they found a good location for landing. The surface Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. Uh oh. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. So it's flying on rockets. It's slowing itself we down with rockets, folks. Completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. This might be how you kids land on Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to earth tones. As expected. As expected. Sky crane maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. 20 meters, guys. It's almost there. Getting signals from MRO. You got it. I think they got it. Oh. Sound confirmed. Yeah. They did it. On the surface of Mars, we begin seeking the sands of half life. Okay, so the sky crane has detached, the cables have detached, and it's uh, getting signal through the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, I think they said. Yeah, this it's, a, it's done, and it's good. And you could tell from the room, but notice there's not the high fives that you might remember from 2012. It's a little different this year with the pandemic. Hard to imagine how much relief these folks are feeling. We're going to wait for the images. This is so exciting. The team is beside themselves. It's, it's, it's so surreal. Stay tuned. We might get some pictures. Yeah. So the first images are coming any moment now. They won't be great. They'll probably be low resolution black and white pictures like usual. But this will be the proof that we landed it right side up. So much. 
interest in writing on this. Yeah. yeah, we just heard the news that perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. It's not, uh, you guys think that was easy, but it wasn't. But we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy activity. That is as expected. It was crazy the first time they did it eight years ago. Now they're just proving that it wasn't a fluke. Yeah. <laughs> We, we make it look easy as a country, but we're, 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 this is still something that fails most of the time. And it's amazing what this is. So I, these are moments when I think about all of the humans have lived throughout history and all the stuff We've that they wish the we could do and if they could see this now. Live on the surface of Mars. Congratulations to the mission. Looks like we have some more news in. It looks a like picture. the first image. We got our picture. Here, take a look at the first image. Come on. Enlarge. <laughs> the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. Wow. Yeah, they have a little black and white picture. It's the first thing they one. caught. Can they show it to us? Come on. I see I see the horizon, so it is right side up. I see it on another stream. It's delayed on, on here, but it, they'll... I'm sure they'll put it full screen in a second. But did you folks see the, 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 the target landing? I didn't see it. Showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. So it's in the safe zone. Oh, there it is, folks. Check it out. A beautiful place to do science the first image from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now it comes from the engineering cameras known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day. Wow, I was nervous, I was worried, but now we know they did a great job and it was perfect. You can almost still see the dust settling in that image. <laughs> yeah, and if you haven't seen the video, the sky crane does create a lot of dust. So it, it creates a turbulent environment, and it takes a while for everything to settle back down. But there's also wind on Mars, and that would also clear the air, too. Yeah, and isn't that one of the main purposes of the sky crane is to not stir up a lot of dust and create a lot of havoc on the ground when the delicate rover's coming down? Right. And now, thanks to folks being, I'm going to lower the audio in the mission control, although I hope you still are watching the jubilant engineers. Um, and I'll tune back in if I hear them making any major announcements. But I also want to, I bet we probably have a thousand more questions from the folks that are participating because now they've seen that this worked. You know, I hope you have more questions. But what Christian just said, folks, um, maybe if you've watched spacex rockets that land on their tails you know what we're talking about when something comes back down on retro rockets and it uses rockets to slow itself all the way to the ground when spacex does that with rockets they're landing on a landing pad that doesn't have any dust on it so they can go all the way down to the ground and it looks okay but if you did that on mars with all that sand oh, oh another picture they're near the ground so these are pretty close you can see the wheels there uh, and and and, the, and they're a little dirty because you've got uh, glass covers over these these cameras. But uh, we took these seconds after landing, so so they're still dust in the air from our landing event. Uh, so this is this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just seconds ago. Just arrived. And, Look at uh, this is really amazing. And uh, we even know where we landed. This is the most amazing thing. The vehicle has told us where, where it's landed because it new, figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. And we put our arms together. And our um, hands Bobby, together. your stream actually isn't live. This is what NASA does. This it's is not. What you can do as a yeah, click, if you click on that live button, it should be. Yes. All right, now it's live. Ah, oh, so you mean I was actually getting a signal behind time like the actual humans were? Um, <laughs> I think it was yeah. behind by just like 30 seconds or something. Ah, well, that makes sense why we had a discrepancy. But still, I'll leave it playing. But thank you for letting me know that we were actually doing exactly what the folks at, at JBL were doing. We were seeing it after the fact as the signal got to us. But that was unintentional on my part. But thanks for pointing that out. I'm not sure who to thank. But uh, now, 
if we have more questions. I would love to let you hear the talking heads. Of course, you can always do that. But I thought maybe perhaps we can make this more personalized for the Fairbanks Museum's audience and answer questions that you might have about what's going on. So there's a lot of excitement going on and I'll pause whenever I see a new picture or some new information. But let me hear from all of you folks, if there's anything else. Yes, Bobby, I have another question that came in earlier. Um, Hollis, age eight from Newark, Vermont, would like to know how fast did the rover uh, travel to get to Mars? Okay, while it was cruising, it was going around 50,000 miles an hour. So just imagine that. And around launch time, you know, when the rocket took off, the rocket got it up to about 25,000 miles an hour. And then they used gravitational maneuvers to get it up even faster. So the fast, the easiest answer is 50,000 miles an hour, roughly for the most of the trip. And that means it only took seven and a half months to get there because it launched on July 30th. Are we there yet? Yes, kids, the trip distance and the length of time you'd be in space is the biggest factor as to why we haven't sent people to Mars. We can send robots because we don't have to worry about their health, but protecting human bodies is a different story. And that's why we still haven't done it yet. So what's the next question? Yes. Um, Braden, age 10 from Morgan, Vermont, wants to know, who do you think will colonize Mars? <laughs> well, I think I think I know who on earth thinks he's going to do it. Elon Musk is very upfront about his plans to colonize Mars, but I don't know. I know too much of the history of the earth to want to do anything called a colony ever again. And uh, I would like to come up with a better name for it, but definitely there are lots of people who are very interested in going to Mars. NASA is doing it scientifically and safely, but there are other groups that might want to try to get there even faster. And it's possible that SpaceX might be sending missions to Mars in the near future. And there's other projects that have been mentioned, like the Mars One project from Belgium, that is an effort to raise money. But, you know, the question is, how are we going to do it safely? Whoever gets the first humans to Mars, it will just be a great accomplishment that humans got there in the first place, whether it goes on a NASA rocket or a SpaceX rocket, or even if China lands people on the on Mars first, I won't be sad. I will be thinking about the greatness of humanity. But the next step is, what do we do when we're there? Now, people like Elon Musk have advocated things like terraforming Mars. This is not a new concept. It's as old as science fiction uh, about Mars. But the idea that we could make Mars like Earth. Anybody watch Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger? That was the coal point of that movie right they terraformed mars now elon musk wants to do that it's even the cover picture on his twitter uh, account it shows mars becoming earth-like but my question is what if this robot finds life on mars or what if we find that there is some kind of weird ecosystem underground on mars wouldn't it be a repeat of the same mistakes we've made in the past if we try to destroy or change this ecosystem before we even know what's there so I'm on the side of let's study Mars and learn everything we can about it because Mars has secrets that we still don't know yet. And maybe if life lived on the surface of Mars, what if there are places, pockets where it's safe to live underground and anything that we do to make a different atmosphere on Mars and change the weather on Mars will certainly cause things that live there to probably go extinct. And I think the biggest tragedy of human history would be that we cause extinctions on another planet after causing extinctions here. So I think we should be cautious, but I definitely think we should go. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who's an astronaut named Mae Jemison, and she has claimed that she would wish to die on Mars. She's not in a hurry. I mean, she's not. she wants to live a nice full life, but she wants it to be possible so that by the time she's at the end of her life, Mars could be where she is when she passes away. So there are people with that goal. And I'll tell you kids, whatever your goal is to live or die on Mars, you might get your wish very soon. So let me know if uh, any more questions are coming in. I feel bad talking over all these brilliant people at NASA, but of course you could just tune into theirs and I could also play other videos too, but I'm keeping my eyes on this because I wanna make sure we don't miss any new developments. 
So let me hear those questions. Uh, anybody has got Karina? Yes. Uh, Hi. Oh, I see a, a kid has just popped up in my screen. Oh, oh that's the NASA. I thought that was one of ours too. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see what this kid has to say. Thank you. Oh, it was a nice awesome. message with a greeting card. Sorry. I thought for some reason Karina had switched my screen and it was one of the kids that we were talking to. So all of us are in Zoomlandia nowadays. So what's I the do have a question. Okay, who's that speaking up? Um, Zoe. Zoe, okay, go ahead. What's your question? So if we were to put people on Earth um, on Mars, how would be your rust estimate of years to get there? The, how long would it take to get there? Yeah, about seven and a half months. But then you don't want to just turn around and come back, right? So let's say you spend a few months there, right? And then you come back home. Altogether, it could easily be a more than a year or a year and a half, right? So this is where the danger comes because on Earth, our atmosphere protects us from the vast majority of the radiation coming from outer space. Cosmic rays, X-rays, gamma rays, they're everywhere, but our atmosphere absorbs most of them. So here under the atmosphere of Earth, you don't have to worry about that. But if you're sitting in a spacecraft traveling to Mars for seven and a half months, you're kind of exposed to everything that space has to give us. And some of those things are harmful, like the radiation. So if you want to know a little bit more about what NASA has been doing to prepare for this, you should look up what Scott Kelly did, the astronaut who spent an entire year in space. He donated his body to science and he spent an entire year on the space station because it gave NASA an opportunity to see what happens to the human body that's been in space for that long. So prepare for the astronauts to go to Mars. And I don't know if you kids have heard about Scott Kelly, but he's a fascinating astronaut because he also has an identical twin brother named Mark Kelly, who now happens to be a senator in the United States Senate. But Mark Kelly and Scott were both twins, identical twins when they were born. And they both became Air Force pilots. So they made almost identical life choices. And then they both became astronauts. So it's like you have two people that don't only start with the same DNA, but they actually take the same jobs in their life. And they do almost everything the same, except that Mark Kelly retired from NASA after 54 days in space. And his twin brother, Scott, spent 540 days in space total. So we have exactly 10 times more time in space for one brother than the other. So the two identical twin brothers, when they take DNA tests before they became astronauts, their DNA was identical. But now when Scott Kelly takes a DNA test and his brother Mark takes a DNA test, they are no longer identical twins. That means his DNA has mutated from the radiation in space. And that could be potentially harmful because most mutations don't cause you to become Deadpool or Wolverine or Jean Grey or any of the X-Men. That's mutations in comic books. In reality, mutations cause cancer and illness and all kinds of horrible diseases. So Scott Kelly, I can't say that he's become ill, but he does go volunteers blood and, and other samples to NASA on a regular basis and they're tracking his health. And anything that happens to him would help us predict what could happen to somebody who goes on one of these long Mars missions. But this is the good news on all of this. This is why space science is worth every penny we spend on it. If we figure out how to prevent uh, Scott Kelly from getting sick, if we figure out how to fix broken DNA that is damaged from radiation, we, we will also be fixing another problem on Earth. If we can fix Scott Kelly's DNA, we can probably cure cancer. So the cure for cancer may actually come from the research done for space science. And that's yet another reason why this stuff is so good for all of us. A lot of people might think wasting money on robots to go to another planet, what's the point of that? But I'll remind you, the number of things that have come from NASA that have benefited our daily life, for example, anybody like uh, duct tape, solar panels, Velcro, I mean, that's just the three things I could think of off the top of my head that were developed by NASA research that now everybody gets to benefit from. So just think of the fact that maybe space science will lead us to curing cancer. That is an awesome thing. And that is one of the possibilities in this new world that we are exploring with leaving planet Earth. So I'll stop talking and waxing poetically and see who the next question is. All right. Um... 
Ethan from Danville, Vermont wants to know, are there gems or diamonds in the rocks on Mars? Ooh. So nobody has found anything like that yet. But we have found interesting crystals. Oh, they have the Wright Brothers plane. That's pretty funny to think about today. But um, just so you know, when Curiosity was looking on the ground, oh, there's Ingenuity, by the way, folks. That's when he was being tested. So I don't know when they're going to launch that. I don't imagine that's going to be today. They probably have way too many things on their plate for today. But this is a little bit of the behind the scenes of the testing in the laboratory. But... Um, what was the question, Karina? I think I got distracted by the video. <laughs> Please tell me again. No problem. Um, Ethan wants to know, are there gems or diamonds in the rocks on Mars? Yeah, so the gems and diamonds, sorry. I can't tell you that. But some of the things that I remember having been found on Mars before, um, has anyone ever seen concretions? People call them clay babies. They are little roundish shapes of hardened clay that you can find in places like Wells River by digging in the clay banks by a, a stream. Well, on Mars, the rover named Opportunity found concretions in an area that's now called Blueberry Fields. And those rocks are not valuable. They're not precious gems. They're made out of clay, but they were proof that water once covered that area because concretions can only form with clay interacting with water and chemical reactions that happen only with water. So that was one of the first hints that we had water and then Phoenix proved it. But gems and minerals, sorry, there's lots of quartz. In fact, one of the things Curiosity found was strangely cracked rocks where the cracks had filled up with quartzite minerals that looked like white veins inside of dark rocks. So you'll see crystals and you'll see colors of rocks that are not all the same color as the red that you see. That is the red dust. But under that dust, there are rocks that are as colorful as the ones that we have here on Earth. In fact, you know, I have in my uh, pictures plan, I can probably show you if we get off of this video stream, but there's, a, there's Curiosity actually photographed some rocks at night with artificial light, with its own headlamp, you could say, because they wanted to see how the rocks looked under artificial light compared to the natural sunlight. So. When you see those pictures, you'll see that the rocks are actually all kinds of colors, not all red. So it's not like everything on Mars is red. It's just everything is dusty. So what's the next question? Yeah, I, I think the next one kind of relates to that one. Um, Laura from on Facebook asked, how far away are we from searching for fossils on Mars? Well, I'm not expecting it, but it could be that Perseverance finds something that's big enough for us to see. It's got the pixel tool that's meant to look for signs of life on the molecule size, so we won't see that. That'll just be chemical residue that it picks up. But it also has a microscopic imager. It's sort of like a little robotic microscope kit. It's a two-part thing called, well, you can get the sense of humor, the folks at NASA, Sherlock and Watson are the names of the two tools that can visualize what's on the ground. So Pixel might pick up the molecules, but Watson and Sherlock, the detectives, might actually see something. And it's not impossible to imagine that if there was ever fossils on Mars or maybe something with a shell or something that had bones, this is all speculation because this is all wildly out there. We have no evidence for this, but if there were things like that, then we have a tool that could see them, but there's no guarantees. And even if, I mean, just remember, let's, let's be realistic about this. Uh, the life on Earth that existed in the past, is it easy to find or do you have to do significant digging and investigation to find it? I mean, there are some places like Button Bay or uh, Chazy Reef in Vermont where you can actually see fossils lying on the ground. So what if the rover lands in a place where the fossils are sitting out in the sun? That would be nice. But chances are, if there were ever fossils on Mars, they're probably buried under many, many layers of dust. And it wouldn't be something sticking out in the air, but something we'd have to dig down and find. But still, you could see why they picked that spot. That spot where the ancient river flowed into a lake is gonna give you the maximal chance to find that kind of stuff because all that erosion caused by rivers brings sediment that might have come from other places. So 
if you're at the bottom of a lake, you might find a fossil from a, the mountaintop that got washed downstream. A lake is kind of like a concentrator of whatever is in the area. So that's why they pick this spot. So good question. But if we find fossils, you'll be hearing about, I'll be jumping off the roof of the Fairbanks Museum to talk about that. So you won't, you won't miss that news if it happens. All right, the next question comes from Amelia from Danville, Vermont, and she wants to know how long will a rover be on Mars? Well, the quick answer is forever. There is no plan to bring Perseverance back home. And just imagine what it would take. It would have to be another rocket waiting there for it to get inside of and launch back up. So it's not impossible that someday the Smithsonian could have Perseverance on display but if that happens, that'll be because humans are going back and forth to Mars. So we're bringing back, you know, souvenirs. Um, but in reality, I would like to imagine that the places where these robots land will become something close to like a national park in the future. It'll be like an archeological site, like an Egyptian pyramid. You're not gonna go in there and say, hey, I'm gonna break off a piece of this pyramid as a souvenir. You probably would be in big trouble if you did that in Egypt, right? But because we we think of these things as, as you know, preserved and protected things. So right now there's a group of people trying to do that for the moon sites on the moon. Well, it's not like we expect tourists to be on the moon any day now trampling over where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk, but it's not impossible to imagine that in the future, these sites could be vulnerable from future development. So there's a group that's trying to create protected areas, kind of like national parks in space and I agree, I mean, it's not a very big part of the moon, but if you imagine drawing a little border around where the Apollo 11 landed, and they probably won't let anybody touch that because we want to keep it as a historical record. That might be what happens to these robots on Mars. I don't know. That might be your decision, whoever asked. You might be the person who's the governor of Mars that makes that choice in the future. Who knows? So any more questions? Yes. Uh, Brennan, age five, from Newark, Vermont, wants to know how fast can the rover drive on Mars? Okay, I, I said it before, but it's not a race car. I think its top speed is like five miles per hour, and that they'll never actually drive it that fast because they really want it to crawl. They don't want to mess it up. They also want to make sure they don't miss anything because we're, you know, what if we drive right by that awesome fossil because we didn't see it because we we're going too fast. And it's also dangerous, you know, there's a lot of rocks on Mars. And I should mention that those wheels that the rover has are not rubber tires. That, if you can imagine at that cold temperature, rubber would just become hard and brittle and snap. So the wheels are actually solid aluminum. And the outside of the wheels is just a thin sheet of aluminum. And they have holes in them, so that gives it traction, like cleats or treads. But the rover that's been on Mars for now, uh, almost 10 years, Curiosity, its wheels are really chewed up. We actually, I, I, if, if I could find it or you can, any of you can search it online from JPL's website, they took some pictures of the wheels and there's a lot more holes in them than they were when they sent them out there. The aluminum has been pierced by many rocks and stones, but they were designed so that they could get filled with holes and they still work. So pretty cool wheels. And if you want some insight on this, the wheels that we invented for the rover on the moon, the moon buggy that the Apollo astronauts got to ride around in. I got to see these wheels up close at the museum in Seattle, the, the Boeing Museum of Flight, great museum if you ever wanna see some of the coolest airplanes in history and actual pieces of equipment from the moon landings. But the moon rover that they have there, its wheels are made out of mesh, like, uh, like, like, like hardware cloth, like a really thick metal screen, like mosquito netting. And that means that they could get traction, but they don't weigh very much. I wish my tires were made out of hardware cloth or something like that, because in mud season, I wouldn't get all that mud crammed up in my wheels. It would just flick right out when I drove. But anyway, so not a race car, the Rovers, but amazing vehicles. So what's the next question? Yes, uh, Peregrine, age six, and Julian, age nine, from St. John's Bay, Vermont, want to know who built the Rover and how was it built? Aha. Well, it took more than 10 years to build this. And the team, some of the folks that you've seen on this live stream, not this guy crooning. I don't exactly know what this guy is doing, but uh, this is part of the entertainment that NASA has for you. Uh, oh, that's a very cute picture. But the people who built the robot in general work at JPL, 
which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, which is also home to the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Most people here in Vermont have heard of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston or Cambridge, but actually, you know, California's got a famous Institute of Technology too. And the JPL lab has been responsible for most of the things that we send to Mars and other planets, the things that land on the surface. Um, and if you've, again, a great way to see behind the scenes at JPL is that movie with Matt Damon, The Martian. That's a science fiction movie, but we're not that far away from that science fiction becoming science fact. There's a few quibbles I have factually with the movie. It's not 100% accurate, but one of the things that it does show you is um, that you get to see the folks at JPL running around and looking for the robots. And, and it kind of shows you the kind of chaotic scientific atmosphere that these folks work in. It's a movie, so it's not exactly reality. But if you haven't seen it, you'll notice that the guy who you might know as Lendo Calrissian from the recent Solo movie, uh, Donald Glover, also known as Childish Gambino, he plays an orbital dynamicist there. And the funny thing is when they find him, he's sleeping on the floor of his office and he keeps stumbling around. He's got papers all over the place. And that part, I've actually seen that with my own eyes at NASA places. Some of those people have very messy offices, but that's okay, because they're so smart, it doesn't matter. So what's next? All right. The next question is from Walter, age three, from Walden, Vermont. He would like to know, how does the drill that collects samples work? Ah. Well, it's not, now, if you, uh, Christian, if you can find a picture of, of what they're talking about on the toolkit, um, it, that way be, this might be better than my description, but it's not exactly like the kind of drill that you use to make a little hole in a piece of wood. It's actually more like a grinder that its purpose is to clean off the surface and create a spot where they have a clean sample where there isn't any dust so they can drill into the rock and get inside the rock without it getting contaminated from all the surface dust. So they wanna see what the rock is made out of without getting uh, a mix uh, of the other stuff. So that's the rock abrasion tool. I'm not sure if they're still calling it that with perseverance, but on curiosity, it was called the rat, the rock abrasion tool, real fancy. So that just means that it tells you it's not really a drill, it just looks like one. So. It's more like a yeah, I got I got an image with uh, that shows the 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 tool on the end of the robotic arm. I'm gonna try to find a better one, like more up close and detailed. Sure, and I might I I as much as I like this, I'm gonna stop the sharing of the screen only because the hey that cool concert. I, I certainly want to hear their music, but this way I can at least share some more extra pictures with you folks. And let me and this I can answer some of your questions a little better that way. So let me know what other questions are out there, Karina and. Uh, we're working on that picture of the rat for you now. Thank you. Yeah, we have one more question on my list and it comes from John from St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And he said that going to Mars seems difficult because a number of previous missions have failed. So why is it so hard to get to Mars? Uh, well, long story short, it's all of those, well, if you watch the seven minutes of terror video, it will do a better explanation than I will by telling you this, but we can get things up into space pretty easily. And once it's flying through space, there isn't that much that can go wrong because we don't expect it to crash into anything in interplanetary space. There's really empty. It's really a good name, space. But it is always the launches and the landings where all the risk can happen. And actually, I hate to bring this up, but if you think of the history of human spaceflight, two of our greatest tragedies with the space shuttle era occurred, one, during launch with the Challenger mission, and I was in second grade watching that live on TV, and that shows you how going up in a rocket is always dangerous, because a rocket is basically a bomb that goes off in a controlled fashion. And if that bomb goes in an uncontrolled fashion, it becomes an explosion. So rockets are inherently incredibly dangerous. But the other space shuttle mission where we lost lives 
was the Columbia disaster. And that was when the space shuttle was re-entering the atmosphere. In fact, you probably saw the time when the scientists in JPL were the most nervous was when they were doing atmospheric entry because that's when everything can go wrong. The whole thing is going really fast. It's really shaking really hard and the outside gets heated to a thousand degrees. So if anything goes wrong, it's gonna happen probably during the launch or during that landing. And if there was, for example, a crack in Perseverance's heat shield when it was coming down, maybe they didn't see the crack. Maybe the crack formed from the cold in space and they had no idea it was there. But when all of a sudden the robot trying to land, the, the heat shield busts open and the robot gets cooked while it's flying through the air at a thousand miles an hour. Well, that could have happened today, but it didn't. So there's so much danger. But whenever people are involved, we have to be a hundred times more careful because if perseverance crashed on Mars, it would be a big shame and a big, you know, be sad. And we'd be having a very sad discussion right now, but nobody would have died. Right. So it's a different level of sadness. It's not really that sad. But if we're sending humans to Mars, we don't want anything to happen to them. So this is why we haven't yet. It's not because we can't. It's because we want to make sure we're absolutely safe before we send people to Mars. So I think it's almost 430. I can't believe how fast the time has gone by. But there is a lot going on. And everything that we talked about is just beginning. So I want to thank uh, Christian, too, for helping me out so much. I, I couldn't have done this without Christian and Karina. Um, uh, you know, here managing this whole crazy event, but it really would not be anything if it wasn't for you folks that chose to spend your afternoon tuning in to this. So I really am grateful for everybody who chose to spend some time with us at the Fairbanks Museum. You can still watch NASA's live feed. It's going to be going on. And every day in the news, I hope you follow what's going on with this rover. I can't tell you when, but I can tell you that someday soon, Perseverance might answer that question of, is there life on Mars? Too bad David Bowie's not around to find the answer. But this is a great day in the history of humankind. It's just one small step, as Neil Armstrong said, one small step that will lead to us becoming the interplanetary species that we're destined to be. So those of you kids watching, I see some of your faces. It's like you, this is all for you, all this messing around with robots on Mars is so that when you were adults, you kids, we'll be able to send people to Mars. And maybe one of the kids watching today will be one of the explorers of Mars. So I always tell this to my audience. If any of you kids go to Mars, my only request is that you bring me a little pebble. Bring me a pebble from Mars and you have completed my life. You'll never see a happier person than me when a kid brings me a pebble from Mars. So go for it. I can't wait to see who gets there first but I know some of you will get there someday. So maybe I'll be with you. However, if we have any more questions. Uh, yes, let's do the, I think Christian answered one of them, but the last question is um, from Walter again, and he wants to know what does earth look like from Mars? Ah, well, I could tell you this and you can look it up, but earth actually looks well Mars tonight in the sky. If it gets clear and it's not cloudy, then you can see Mars as a red dot near the constellation Taurus, close to the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, also known as Subaru. So you can see Mars, and just imagine, if you were standing on Mars, Earth would look like a dot of the same, roughly same brightness, a little brighter, and blue. So we see a red dot, they see a blue dot. But who's going to be the first person to see that blue dot from Mars? That's going to be a cool picture. And I should mention this, but folks, this kind of thing that we do here at the Fairbanks Museum is not a, does not come for free. We offer these to the public for free because we want everybody to know. But if you want to show your gratitude to the Fairbanks Museum, the easiest way you can do is to become a member of the Fairbanks Museum. If you buy a family membership for your family, you can not only get into the museum, but you get tickets to the planetarium when we reopen that. And you also get discounts at our shop. And the biggest benefit perhaps that most people don't know about our membership is that getting a Fairbanks Museum membership also allows you to get extreme discounts at other museums all around the country, including museums that actually cost more to go into than our annual membership does. So I'm not gonna say where those are, uh, California. But anyway, the point is you can go almost for free to a museum that would cost you the same as one of our memberships does 
And when you go there, you can say, show them your membership card and you walk right in. But the most important thing that happens when you give money to the Fairbanks Museum is that it pays for us to do things like this. So we will hopefully be doing more of these events in the future. We're planning on during this time and maybe expanding once, once a month, we might be doing some kind of a live event. So if you'd like to see this kind of thing happen, tell everybody you know, buy a membership at the Fairbanks Museum. Just like any small business in this time of the pandemic, we've struggled to stay open. We've struggled to make sure that everything is running smoothly and you can help great and a great deal with that. So don't wanna end with that note, but please, if you can support the Fairbanks Museum, go to our website and get yourself a family membership or think of all the gifts you can give that way. You can certainly buy memberships for other people. So consider that a great gift for any birthdays coming up. And maybe on that note, if we have any last questions before I say goodbye, Karina. No, we, we answered all the questions that came in. And I, I just want to say thank you to everybody who tuned in and sent us your questions. And we hope to see you next time we, we do a live stream. Thank yep. you, Bobby. Well, thank you, Karina. And thank you, Christian, for your great service to this mission here. But uh, Yeah, it was great watching with you all. I'm so excited that this mission's finally safe and on the ground on Mars. Yes, I feel like jumping around for joy. <laughs> Can't wait to get off so I can make a fool of myself out of public. But yes, it's a very exciting day. And I'm glad that all of you were here with us. But it's not over. Keep tuned in to NASA and see what else they discover. All right. Anybody else out there? Otherwise, keep looking up. And be safe. Be well. And we hope to see you soon. <laughs>